All right, in this chapter, we're going to talk about the failure or fracture of different types of materials. We've got ceramics, we've got plastics, and we've got metals, okay? So these things all fail very differently, and that's because they have different mechanisms of failure. Let's do an example. Let's take this glass jar. I'm going to put it in a plastic bag so we don't get shards of glass everywhere. But I'm going to close this up, and I'm going to set it in this vise. And just in case, I'm going to throw some glasses on. Now, you know in a vise, as I turn this, I'm not actually changing the, the deformation all that much. It's actually a pretty small amount of squeezing. So the strain that this is going to experience is going to be a small strain. But you'll see that, and you know this from experience, ceramics can tolerate basically no strain. So let's give it a shot. Yeah, so I probably only squoze it, you know, fractions of a millimeter, and yet you saw that it broke. Now, how did it break? Let's take a look at this. If you look inside this, you'll notice that there are pieces everywhere, right? There are pieces all over the place, and I'm not going to open this up because I don't want to cut myself on it, but if you were to look at the surface of the ceramic, you'd notice that <clears throat> it has very characteristic patterns that we're going to cover in this chapter. There's a single point where this flaw starts, and then it grows rapidly outwards, and you can see the lines pointing towards that initial flaw. We'll see some examples in this chapter. Now, how does that compare to a plastic? Well, you know that you can take a plastic cup and I can deform it quite a lot. And it's mostly reversible. If you look closely, it's now white on the edges, so there might be some irreversible damage happening here. But overall, these are much tougher. They're much tougher to break, right? In fact, I can take these, and even if I cut it, right, if I apply an additional, an additional flaw where this thing has been cut, all of a sudden it becomes much easier to fracture. Where if I tried that without the flaw, it doesn't break at all. So something about having an initial flaw makes it easy for that thing to break into two pieces, right? And if we continue, this would probably continue all the way until we have two separate components, and that's when you have fracture, right? So this is two pieces. It was controllable. I could keep on applying force, and if I applied force, the flaw continued to progress, but that was not the case with the glass ceramic. Once the flaw started, it continued to propagate in a, in a spontaneous manner, right? I didn't have to keep applying force. It just broke on its own. Whereas this thing, I had to keep applying force. And what about metals, right? If you take this can, it is also deformable, right? You can deform it and it hasn't fractured into two pieces. And similarly, if I cut this thing, if I apply a cut to it, now you'll see that it's relatively easy to continue that fracture. Get it started a little bit better, right? Once we get it going, it's relatively easy to <laughs> rip it right in half, right? Um, some characteristics of metal and polymers that they share is that if you keep on flexing this, we find that over time it would get weaker and weaker and weaker until it would break, right? So there's something about the cyclic nature where it doesn't break on the first 10, 20, 100, even 1,000 deformations, but it might break after 10,000 or a million times. So what's happening to the internal microstructure is something else we're going to cover in this chapter, okay? So that's just a, um, a quick... Uh, primer on the different types of fracture that we're going to see in materials. Now we're going to dive into the math uh, that explains the different mechanisms responsible for these different behaviors.